Okay, so here we go. So Illinois Digital Archives, um, there are 20 collections. Let's see. There are 20 collections in the um, Illinois Digital Archives, uh, and which I'm going to show you in just a minute. And these are just some of the things that you can find. Uh, keep in mind that they're 21 years old right now, the digital archives, and every day they add more and more materials from libraries, universities, historical centers, um, genealogy programs. So every day you can find more and more. And you can find photographs. I'm going to show you a lot of photographs. Ignore that person. We're going to. I'm going to show you photographs. There are oral histories, oral histories, audio oral histories that you can listen to. You all you do is just click on, and you can listen to these people tell their story, which is just absolutely fascinating. Uh, lots of manuscripts, a lot of federal government documents. Uh, I'm going to show you some postcards, posters, videos. Uh, uh, Elgin in particular has a great deal of newspapers. Um, and then, of course, Illinois uh, Transportation has put on uh, quite a bit of maps that include not only plan of surveys, but railroad maps as well with the name of the railroad. So that's kind of cool. Oh, here we go again. Yeah. There we go. Here, here are the, the uh, collections that I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about community histories, genealogical resources, institutional um, in institutions, uh, Lincoln Inia, Illinois maps, Illinois postcards, publications, oral history, social movement, and healthcare history in Illinois. But look, there's African Americans in, uh, in Illinois. I wish I could move that thing up at the top. Uh, transportation, history, Illinois life in 2020 talks a great deal about COVID, a, a great deal about COVID and the impact that it has had on uh, the economy, the people, uh, the job, jobs, just awful. Uh, industrial history, uh, military history, a lot of military history, museum collections, nature, and state history. But the one thing that I want you to remember is that just because I'm only talking about the ones that are highlighted in yellow, these can also be included. Um, for instance, community histories could also be in military history. You could have multiple collections in the same, in the same, uh, like on the same photograph. They just put it in multiple places, which is really good to find. And here's community history. Yeah, I really don't like the screen is at the top, but what am I going to do? Uh, community histories. Uh, and uh, there are lots and lots of different communities and local histories uh, in the cities of Illinois that have participated in uh, sending their material to the digital archives. And this is Alton area local history. And it, it'll tell you it's a collection of photographs and postcards related obviously to the Alton area. Some of my children, their um, ancestors um, are from the Alton area. And so that's why I was particularly interested in this area. And you'll see right here, can we, oh, oh, oh. sorry, let's go back. Let's go back. You'll see right here, if I can do it nice and easy this time, community history. And then sometimes there'll be more um, of the collections listed. So here we go. Uh, I have been given permission to use all of the photographs in this um, uh, PowerPoint, unless I didn't need it. It was just, uh, there was no copyright intended and we could just use it for free. Okay. So this is a woman in, uh, the Alton area, a tavern. Uh, she looks manager Watts, and I'm assuming that that might be the manager because she's pointing to that particular uh, title. And here's Marjorie Bryant of uh, Denver. She was enthroned as the queen at a junior class party. Um, and the little tiny flower girl is Barbara Olin. This picture was taken in May 1938. Now, say for instance, um, you 
were looking for one of your particular ancestors. And you, at the very beginning, you can do a search, uh, just a general search. Like for instance, I was playing around and I just did a Gettysburg Address. And I got lots and lots of hits where from this collection, I didn't have to go into a specific collection. I just typed a Gettysburg Address at the top and I got lots and lots of hits, which would take you to where you wanted to go. But say, for instance, you were looking for this particular woman, this little Barbara Olin. There she is. And you may never have seen that picture before. And here it is free. Uh, so, and we're beating. Uh, this is Illinois, the Democratic Lincoln Douglas Square phone booth. Phone booth. Everybody here has seen a phone booth but maybe some of the people online have never seen a phone booth. And I just thought, holy cow, pretty cool. A phone booth it, in the middle, it's kind of like in a nice little area too, not like on a corner or street corner or whatever. Uh, this is a grocery store. Again, look at the grocery store. Look at all of the items that they carry uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. They have coffee, they have hard goods, they have, uh, uh, bread and um, vegetables. I'm sure those are vegetables in there. Well, I'm pretty sure they're vegetables. Looks like they have bread. Please do not ask for credit. You see that sign up there? Please do not ask for credit. Time to tell. Time to tell. And these are just some of the images from this collection. Sometimes you'll see at the bottom uh, on the right-hand side here, I'll have put like a number in some images. That will be the number of images in that particular collection. And some of them are thousands. This little boy <laughs> who was just too cute, uh, was a, he's at a band concert at Riverview Park with a crown and a baton, possibly to conduct the musical piece, The Typewriter in August, 1970. Too cute, too cute. This is the, uh, the Chicago Ridge Public Library. This is the collection that they have posted. Um, and I've had permission from the director to use this. The reason I included Chicago Ridge is because I grew up in Chicago Ridge, uh, Illinois, um, in the, well, I can't even date myself, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I remember going to the library. Let's see. I remember going to the library. This is Ann Poe. She was the first administrative uh, director. Um, and she held that position from 64 to 81. I don't really remember Ann at all. Okay. Um, but I do remember this location. And I remember getting my library card and being able to check out one book. That's all you could check out at the time was one book. We're here at the New Lenox Library. If you're a New Lenox Library card holder, there is really no limit to the number of books that you can check out. This was, I just had to include this because I lived in this area. And this is what the library looked like. It was a room probably as big as meeting rooms A and B together. That was the entire library. Just shelves, a couple tables, card table chairs. And this is what we had to, we were able to pick out. And I remember I was hooked on Nancy Drew and mm -hmm. the secret of the old clock. I loved it so much. I got it for Christmas from Santa. And it was, this was a former church, Presbyterian church. Wow. And I, I clearly remember going there as a little girl. And then again, this is the church that was built in 1927, later sold to the village. And this is Elaine Zarnicki. She oh, was my neighbor. You're kidding. No, she worked, I worked with her. Elaine Zarnicki from Chicago Ridge? Yeah. Yeah, she lived right around the corner. My mother and her, oh my goodness. Uh, they had bunko every month. They played bunko. Oh, and you know, every month there were 12 ladies. They would rotate who had bunko. And Elaine Zarnicki, yep, she was my neighbor. Uh, library trustees, Don and Audrey. I don't remember those people, but I do remember Elaine. This is the Piccadilly Gardens at 105th and Ridgeland. And this, this was um, 
uh, first it was a grocery store and then it became a dance hall uh, later on. And then in 1948, Reverend William Gentleman, who I remember from Our Lady of the Ridge Church, established the parish and it was in this location. I remember going up those stairs um, uh, and I made my first communion at this Piccadilly Gardens, which was AKA Our Lady of the Ridge until they moved the uh, church um, over on Ridgeland. So obviously, this is not my time period. This is way before me. Okay, just to clear, clarify that. <laughs> and it was a BFW hall, but I do believe that I, I'm not sure it's still standing anymore. I haven't been over there in a while. This is Gene Siegel. He was the mayor of uh, Chicago Ridge. And look at, uh, he was appointed deputy coroner for Cook County. Uh, he was the assistant chief of the sheriff's office. Uh, he was part worked in the treasurer's office, um, and he was, he was pardon me. He was a Democrat. He, yes, he was a Democrat. But Connected. I went to school with his son Gary Siegel and his daughter, and right across the street were his nieces and nephews, the Devovics. So I said, "Oh my God, there's there's Eugene Siegel. I have to I have to put him up here too." So now we're in a different section. We're in. Um, Again, we're in the community histories, but this is the DeWitt County World War I collection. Um, and again, I have permission to use all of these photographs and these documents. And these are just some of the documents. There are hundreds of veterans from this county that are uh, included in this collection. And this is Thomas Hickman right here. And this is his individual service record. Now, all I had to do was just download this photograph. It, it, it was right there. I didn't have to pay a fee. All I had to do is download the document. And it will tell you uh, the name, his name, Thomas, whatever that says. It's pretty hard to read. Um, and his service in the United States or in home waters. And the date, 1917, 1917, 1918, 1918. And then here, over here, which is difficult to read, because of all the food we have. But that is a brief diary that he wrote of army life. And like the, um, after one month of training, right here, after one month of training, I was sent back to my company and was an instructor in a regional school of the same nature as the one I had just attended. This work continued until about the 1st of the December, 1918, when the boys couldn't take interest in the school as it was time to come home. These are, imagine if you were looking for documents of this man who might have been your relative, and here it is available online. It, it's just such a great uh, genealogical find. And again, this is just one person from the DeWitt County World War I collection. Here's Artie Bennett. Um, Artie was also in the war. This is his, this is his, um, or his uh, service information. And this one on the right is a condolence record. I mean, a condolence letter written to Artie's family by a fellow soldier. And it, he's telling them, um, even though he only knew their son for a little bit of time, he can't, he can't replace their sorrow, but he just wanted them to know how much it meant to him to work to be a soldier with him in the service and how, how brave he was. And can you imagine getting a letter from um, losing your son or losing your daughter and having someone who was there with him uh, telling you how much he was valued? you know, how much his service meant. This is about a woman in the service, Julia, uh, Julia Rogers, which of course you can't see over there. Do you want um, me to get the, um, the guy that... He, he's already left. Oh, okay. Yeah, he already left. I don't... Mm -hmm. if, I had my, if I had a touch screen, I could move that up, but... Like he said, they can edit it real goody. Um, anyway, this is uh, on the left. This is her service. 
This is her service record. And this is a letter that she wrote. But this one is, uh, she's thanking a community. And I want to read it. Um, Dear Mrs. Hall, uh, now Julia is the one writing this. I want to thank you and your neighbors so much for the large amount you so kindly contributed to my smoke fund. Mm. Smoke fund, what is that? I was able to buy many cigarettes, candy, and fruit for the boys and made many of them very, very happy. The boys I have especially given to since my last smoke fund check came in are the boys who were wounded and were German prisoners all this time. They have just recently been sent back here and the poor lads surely do deserve every bit of kindness we can give them. They are sick and wounded and undernourished. We have been giving them eggs and steak and just all we can get to get them on their feet again. And you can imagine what good American candy, cookies and cigarettes tasted like to them. They do not tell of being ill-treated, but were neglected many, many days as they very short of, sur they, and this is just a transcription, and they are very short of surgeons and doctors in Germany. As to the food, they say it was very, very poor, but it was just what the Germans were living on. I shall be very thankful if you will kindly see that your neighbors read this note so they will know how they helped many of the poor boys while away lonely afternoons eating candy and smoking good American cigarettes. What a cool letter, you know. Again, it's right there. And, and it was just transcribed. But that's what she was writing. That letter was, um, this letter was very much longer. I just found the copy of the first page. This is the Chatham area. And again, we're still on community, community histories, right there, community histories. The Chatham area. Uh, provides access to primary and secondary materials that document the historical and current uh, information of Chatham, the townships of Auburn. Again, this is pretty interesting. These are all the townships uh, that are included in this collection. And it says inhabitants, government, environment, businesses, institutions, blah, blah, blah. This will be a growing collection. This is kind of cool. This, if I didn't know better, I could have said that that was one of my ancestors. This is Albina. This is Thomas Reed. is standing behind the buyer's grocery. So you don't see the grocery. Caldwell School is in the left background. The barn is located in between Walnut and Mulberry on Main Street. So that's kind of neat. Here's the school right there. And she's standing behind a grocery. And if I didn't know better, that, that big pot looks like it's uh, broken. <laughs> but what a neat picture. And I said it could have been my grandpa. Uh, this is Sagamon County, Jim. Mrs. Anna Reed, Miss Anna Reed Whitney Bell. She was one of the first uh, telephone operators in this community. And this is pretty neat. This is uh, the Methodist Church Ladies Aid Society. They're shucking corn. Again, pretty neat. Pretty neat. A lot of this, these photographs that you're seeing has metadata underneath it that if they knew the time period it was taken, they indicated that and what part of the collection it was from and who the contributor was. This is an invitation to the 43rd Annual uh, State Fair in Springfield, Illinois, a copy of the original. And what was, uh, oh, wait, let me go back. Yeah. That's pretty neat. The State Fair. I, I've attended the state fair, but I don't think I was ever sent an invitation to, to go to it. This is the postcard collection. Uh, and, and although this is the postcard collection, there are documents included in it as well. So this is the Elgin area of history. And again, see, this is what I want to tell you. It's in, you will find this collection in the community histories and the postcard collections. Okay, and it says a uh, collection of photographs and postcards that includes Sears houses in the area, the tornado of 1920, the Illinois Hospital and Asylum, Asylum, Asylum. Yeah, Asylum for the Insane. Um, and some of you might remember the, Jerry, you probably remember the program that I did on um, insane, insane Asylums. Um, probably two years ago, maybe three. And here is a list of the first owner 
of homes. So you know how you can request property records from uh, the, like the Cook County deeds, you know, a, a property office. Uh, you can get copies of your deeds, but here's a listing of the first owner. It's just an index. Um, it tells you the uh, property owner's name, a little bit about the history, you know, what the, the home looks like, and the address, and the year it was built. This is the year it was built. And they have pages of this, pages of this um, from Elgin. These are just two, two of the pages. This is a photograph of the shoe factory in Elgin, which is turned into Brody's Trophies, and then later the Burlington Coat Factory, which, you know, that's pretty, pretty big, the Burlington Coat Factory. Of course, um, unfortunately, I don't know when it was built because it might have been, oh, it's now condominiums. Okay, cool. That would be neat for condominiums. Um, here's a listing of the, that is so baby that I can't see all my, my typing. These are the names of the veterans that are buried in this particular Black <coughs> City Cemetery. Now, these are only some of the pages. This collection is the courtesy of the Gail Borden Public Library District. Um, uh, this will tell you uh, the veterans that are listed in this particular cemetery. And <coughs> let's see, this is uh, this is also part of the same collection. Again, it's under postcards, but you'll see like this is a, a article on some a couple who was married. This uh, suspicious ones have long been watching for Johnny to step <coughs> off, but those who thought himself the best informed did not place the affair at so early in a day. They're talking about. Um, how he met his girlfriend or his wife to be. Consequently, we'll be surprised to learn that in the very presence of friends of the family last evening, the net was tied. Of the bride, all we know much good and no evil. <laughs> While of himself, those who are best acquainted with him recommend him to his wife. Johnny says he's done nothing to be ashamed of and will therefore defer the customary wedding trip. The couple after congratulations were made, the recipients of some very handsome presents by Relatives and friends, we wish Mr. and Mrs. Chapman years and years of love, love, and prosperity. There are hundreds of pages of newspapers available in this collection from uh, 1869 to 1889. And that's just one newspaper that's available. Sometimes when you're looking at like a, a website like newspapers.com, or chronicling America, those newspapers. Here you can find, it's not on a microfilm reel. You don't have to request it. All you have to do is go to the Illinois Digital Archives and look it up. That's okay. Uh, this is Northern Illinois Hospital for the Insane, the circa 1898. There it is, uh, 1910, the Northern Illinois Hospital for the Insane. And here is an earlier one. Um, down here, um, you can see how they've changed. Why they would have postcards with these kinds of hospital, I'm not exactly sure, but perhaps the um, employees or even maybe some of the patrons, uh, the residents, the patients were able to mail these to their loved ones. This one I just absolutely love. This is an advertisement for Borden condensed milk. And any of the women or men in here who cook or bake, you probably use condensed milk. But this is, look at that cute little uh, advertisement, a little postcard from 1891. And what I really like is that um, Borden, uh, you, what you can um, obtain strictly pure milk from the same company direct from selected dairies delivered to you in steam cleaned bottles, hermetically sealed at Elgin, Illinois, at eight cents per quart. Eight cents per quart. Now you get it in a little tiny can. <laughs> Again, it's just such a cute little, a cute little postcard, especially for the time. And there's the little dog drinking something. Um, because I'm, I have a lot of relatives who are in the medical field, I was very interested in the healthcare 
uh, history of Illinois. This is one nurse. And this is from the Graham School of Nursing. And again, you'll see that it's under Institutional Histories and Healthcare, this collection. So you will see this picture here once, and you'll see it again because it's in another collection that I um, am focusing on. Uh, so this is just a celebration of this, uh, this hospital's 100th anniversary, and they provided a lot of information on the uh, students, the graduates, the, uh, the professors, the teachers, the curriculum in this collection. Again, there's the lady, that's a much better picture. You can see the whole thing. Uh, this is a postcard of two nursing students from 1911. Um, and that's just the number, number 91. This is an old car. Actually, it's an ambulance that they used um, to, you know, to uh, pick up patients or transport patients, I should say. This was a nursing license for Sigma Thomas, Graham Hospital School of Nursing, uh, 1928. And she went on to be um, not only a teacher at the school, but um, I believe the superintendent as well at one time, or a director, I should say. This is a picture of an iron lung, and that is not a real person in there. It is um, a dummy that they, it was just used for commercial use. I mean, a commercial photograph. But again, these are kind, these are some of the photographs that are all available that you can find in this collection. This is another institution, um, another health institution, Blessings Health Professions, the Professions, the first 25 years of history uh, in Quincy, Illinois. Okay. One thing that was really interesting in this collection is that I was able to find a patient information, which is pretty rare that you can find patient information from um, a hospital. And the first patient date includes 10 pages. And this is, this is the, um, the document. And it says, October 4th, 1875, patient Lucy Men Menzer says she has lived with William, I forget his name, and his, but married John Shader, who lives near there over one year ago. Uh, she says that, uh, he says that he left her and um, expects to be, uh, he has left her and uh, then went away. And he expects to be co confirmed uh, three months, hence 18 years old. So she was young. She came to Quincy two days, um, two days since, uh, two days since, told her to go back to Ursa, which is apparently where she is from, and applied to the supervisor, whose name I couldn't read, there. And she, he was indicating that she needed to go there and uh, apply for assistance because he didn't want anything to do with her. William King say, say, and that's what it actually says, says she has lived with him seven years that she got in the family way by John Schaefer and he compelled him to marry her about one week since. So these two men, one she gets pregnant from and the other one is compelling her, the other man to marry this woman. Um, but that she is bad and sassy and he had to discharge her and that her husband is still at home near Ursa and that she will not be confined until after January. Go figure, <laughs> go figure. The woman is pregnant and all of this brouhaha over it. Again, it's right online. It's right online. I didn't have to fill out a form, fill out uh, FOA. It was not a freedom of information. I just was able to get it. Uh, this is a gene ge genealogical resource collection. And uh, again, you might expect to see um, like maybe birth, marriage, and death records, but you'll find a lot of other information, not too much birth, marriage, and death. I found a lot of death records, which was ooh, so good. Uh, this is from Madison County Genealogical Resources up at the top from the Edwardsville Public Library. And it's under publications, state history, and genealogical collections. 
what you really need to keep that in mind that you might be looking under one collection, but it could actually be in another or two other collections as well. So this is uh, the part that I focused on were the cemeteries and tombstones and inscriptions of Madison County uh, and some of these other uh, cemeteries. Uh, I don't think I focused anything on the standard atlas and maybe some naturalization as well. But this is just part of it, again, part of it. Here's where I was talking about right here. There's 231 images just in this collection just in that collection. This is the cemetery tombstone um, uh, from Madison County floor in the Crone Cemetery, okay? And it has uh, Charles William Crone, March 3rd, 1813 to December 5th, 1876. His wife, wife of Charles and her date of birth and date of death. There are the bases of six other stones and it goes in to talk about uh, Charles, when he married Anna Clara, so now you know her middle name is Clara and her maiden name. And then there are 12 children, 12 children, uh, who died. John Henry, Henry, Charles, and Lena died as children and would account for four stones. Anna and Charlotte both married a Mr. Rendler and he had stones placed in <coughs> that are buried here. That's kind of common. Sometimes uh, my one grandmother, she has a, a, a headstone with her name on it, but she's buried somewhere else. She's buried with her first husband, not her second husband. Now, when I was looking at this, I'm thinking, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. So I thought, let me just see if Charles Crone is in Find a Grave, because how many of us <coughs> go to Find a Grave first when we're looking for a dead person? I mean, if we can't find it, we can't find the cemetery, we can't find it in Billion Graves. We can't find that family search or ancestry. We go to family, uh, find a grave. But guess what? It wasn't there. This uh, William Crone was not was not listed at all. I mean, Charles Crone was not listed at all, but no match is found. So if you didn't know that that collection existed, if you didn't uh, look around in this county and in this collection, you would never have found where that man, oh, well, I shouldn't say never have found it would have been more difficult to find him unless you went to like a historical society um, or the, per the uh, library that uh, uh, put this uh, collection online. I was very surprised that Find a Grave did not have that. But it just goes to show that not everything is on Find a Grave. And here is more cemeteries and tombstone inscriptions of Madison County. And I put volume one this is Anderson County, uh, pardon me, Anderson Cemetery, and the page, and this is the um, photo document number 185 out of 231. This is uh, Daniel Trout, and again, just some of the information, but, but the description of where the cemetery is and, um, and this information down here is so valuable. If, if you were looking for this, um, this cemetery or this particular uh, deceased person. And this is a listing of some of the people who are buried in this particular cemetery. Doesn't give you any other information. Well, it does give you this information, but I mean, alphabetical. And there's pages, pages of this available to you. It isn't just one or two, it's pages. A lot of historical societies and genealogy clubs uh, are very interested in re, um, restoring cemeteries. They go out and then they document uh, the GPS location of the plots. They clean off the headstones. They do a lot of restorative um, uh, community service to these uh, cemeteries that are just not faring very well. This is naturalizations and intentions of Madison County and includes over 36 pages, 36 pages of names with dates and naturalization and intention with book numbers and page numbers. So it doesn't actually give you the document itself, but it can tell you where to go in this particular county, in Madison County. So if you're looking for um, uh, Bernard Ackerman, you can go to Bernard Ackerman, 
You can go to, he know he was uh, signed a uh, petition in 1882. This is the book number and that's the page number. And then look at this. These are all other acronyms right there. This is, uh, oh, I um, am always interested in my ancestors' um, community, what the community was like, the businesses, the churches, the people. When I do a family history from, from my family, I don't want just birth, marriage, and death records. Those are wonderful to have. But I want to know what the community was like uh, what were the people like? Um, what did they, how did they make a living? What were their neighbors like? What did they do for fun? What did they do for entertainment? And so I'm always looking for like the history of the county. And I always type in like a, when I do a, a, a book search here, just in WorldCat. And I did, I typed in history of Madison County, Illinois. But the book wasn't available. On, in WorldCat, which is a worldwide uh, catalog system. But when I went into the digital archive right here, I could get the entire book. And there's 698 pages, and you have access to the entire book, not just a couple pages, not just a preview. Uh, so when you're looking for your family's community, this will help, yes. But also don't be afraid to uh, request a book, request a journal, look in uh, articles uh, in uh, magazines and periodicals, uh, and then read it. And then you never know, you might find your relative's name in there. I mean, I did White County, Indiana, and I found several mentions of my Hanaway relatives. It didn't prompt me to buy the book. The book was $100. It didn't prompt me to buy the book, but it did prompt me to get the information from the book. And then of course, cite the book because if you include it in your family history and then you'll say, okay, I got this information from the history of White County, but you don't give any more information. Your ancestors, when you're gone, are not gonna be able to know how to locate that particular item, that particular book resource. This is Oak Ridge Cemetery and just oh, well, probably it gives the clue what's up there. Um, uh, this is, these are all the collections that this particular Oak, Oak Ridge Cemetery is in. But I was just, I just, I thought Oak Ridge, I just thought it was kind of a neat name. And I, I didn't know anything about the cemetery. I did, it didn't click until I kept going along. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute. I know what this cemetery is. Uh, this is where Abraham Lincoln was buried. It was uh, one of the oldest cemeteries and one of the most visited cemeteries. Uh, it has over, I think it has over 4 million visitors each year. It's the second most visited cemetery in the United States. And it has each entry, which they have, each entry includes the name of the deceased, the date of death, the age at death. This is great information. You know how we were talking about documents earlier? The cause of death, a designation of the grave location through a combination of lock, lot, range, and grave numbers, the place of birth and remarks. These records were made available through the collaborative efforts of the Sangamon Valley Collection at Lincoln Library, Oak Ridge Cemetery, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, and the papers of Abraham Lincoln. It, it's mind boggling how much information they are able to provide you with almost everyone who is buried in that cemetery. And so, okay, this is the internment record of Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln. And I, I, I had to look for it because he died in April. And so I figured he was buried in April, like we bury right away today, but not in those days. Now in those days, he had to, you know, first he had to be shown in Washington, D.C., you know, viewed, not shown, viewed. And then he had to, tra they traveled by train to here in um, Illinois. And so I found his record of May 1865, May 4th, Abraham Lincoln, 
cause of death, he was assassinated. Uh, they were receiving, he's a, he was in a tomb and he was born in Kentucky. It does not indicate his age. I was pretty excited when I found this because again, I was looking for April. I didn't realize, I, I mean, I wasn't thinking at the time that um, it would have been May, not April. Um, his tomb was extensively rebuilt because there were a lot of damage. And actually it's been rebuilt twice because of secu security um, concerns. Thieves attempted to steal his body, to steal his body. Uh, his remains had been moved to their final resting place below the floor of the burial chamber uh, after it was renovated. Illinois maps, I talked about um, the maps a little bit earlier. Um, this is a huge collection of maps uh, for, the, for the state from different time periods. Uh, it also includes railroad, highway, and military map collections. I didn't, I didn't go into too much of this. Uh, this is from the Illinois State Highway Maps. Again, here, Illinois Maps, State History, and Transportation. Transportation. And this is one of the guides from the official 1931 guide edition. And there's a covered wagon, a car, Indians. Um, now this is pretty interesting, this chart. It indicates the year right here. And then automobile license issued since 1911 and the automobile Wheel fees received since 1911. So in 1930, where am I? In 1930, 1,638,260 license, automobile licenses were issued and it made $18 <coughs> million. $18 million in 1930. I wonder what they're making today. Too much. Right. You know. Although I can't recall, I think the, the your actual license is like twenty dollars. But where they get you are the plates, which is like 150, 150, 60. Not sure. You said 175. Oh, good. Uh, and this is surveyors. There's lots of uh, plants of survey uh, for those of you who. Um, are interested in where your ancestors lived and the uh, township records of uh, the plants of survey at the uh, for the township. Uh, and some of them include some really cool uh, township legal descriptions, delineation of sections, measurements in chains and acres, typographical vegetation features, uh, timber, bodies of water, saline swamps, uh, and then occasionally man-made features such as roads, settlements, Native American traces, uh, are all notated for 101 counties are included. And this is just a uh, collection of, this is just a sample of Will County from 1856. But they had lots more on Will County. This is just one that I uh, grabbed. Okay. And then Illinois railroad maps show railroads, counties, urbanized areas, and portions of adjacent states. Uh, the best part is that it included the names of the railroads. Included the names of the railroads. Uh, periodicals. Uh, periodicals are magazines. Again, it could include a lot of newspapers. There's a lot of collections in this uh, collection that have lots and lots of newspapers uh, from the 1800s. This one here, Kiwani, I have a patron who uh, I help uh, occasionally with his Kiwani uh, family history. And so when I saw Kiwani up there, I thought, oh, I've got to put this in here. So this would, this, um, these yearbooks are found in publications, institutional histories, community histories, and genealogical collections. So uh, unfortunately, I, this thing chopped off their heads. But what was pretty cool this is the 1904 Kiwani High School track team. Look at these shoes. Who would want to wear those kind of shoes for track? I mean, my feet hurt looking at those. It looks like little teeth on the bottom of them or spikes. And this is the men's track team. 
they have, the Kiwani High School has put uh, almost every one of their yearbooks online. So you don't even have to go to the library. You don't even have to go uh, to ask some, one of your neighbors, do you have the, the high school uh, yearbook? You can go online, they're all, all right there. This is uh, from 1913. This is a, a play that they were putting on. And again, maybe one of your relatives was an actor. And there's a, a bill, this is a bill play from that particular The Seven Wonders of the World. And just gives a little bit of information about the songs that they were singing and who, who played the parts. It would be kind of neat. I have a, one of my grandmothers was supposedly in vaudeville and I would love to find a bill play that she was uh, listed in. Illinois Civil War documents from Fort Sumner, President Abraham Lincoln. This is about a boy. This, uh, this slide here is about a boy. His observations of an Illinois boy in battle camp and prisons from 1861 to 1865. And it really was published by Henry H. Eby from Mendota, Illinois. He was in the 7th Illinois Cavalry. Um, and he, he illustrated this. And this is like a, uh, um, this is when he was young. And then this is afterwards. But unfortunately, this was an artist wrong. But care for him who bore the meat and burden of the battle, the heat, I'm sorry, the heat and burden of the battle, 1861, Abraham Lincoln. Unless you, my son, save me, I will be ruined. Go and do your duty. And if you save me, I will be your generous friend and protector as long as you live. Sad. And here he's talking about um, why he made the decision to join the service and, uh, and then uh, his life in, in, the, in the service. Uh, it, it's probably a, a little over 300 pages um, total. But why he enlisted and then his time in the service, it was really, I read almost the entire um, book and I just thought, oh my gosh, what he went through, because he was imprisoned. Uh, and then when he came out and he talked about how many of his comrades had passed away and how he was returning home. Uh, this is more military history, and it's probably about women. I'm pretty sure. Yes. Ada Adcock, she was a Red Cross nurse. I had indicated I had a family in the uh, medical profession. Ellen Babbitt, and here's another one whose name Francis something or other. And these women were very instrumental. Julia Scott Warman, wife of Charles Schultz Warman. U.S. Assistant Secretary of Agriculture, who went to Europe as a member of the Agriculture Commission. She also worked uh, quite extensively for the American Red Cross at the time. That's her right there. Uh, oral histories. This this one, unbelievable. Uh, World War World War One um, oral histories. Audio and video recordings of oral histories are accompanied by photographs, correspondence, and memorabilia from private collections to illustrate the home Illinois area residents during World War II. And these are just three examples of people who have taken the time to talk about their experience in World War II. Uh, some of them were interviewed, um, some of them just just talked. And right here, it'll tell you how long the uh, recording is. Like this one's almost 57 minutes, this one's 33. It, this is Betty Morrill, James Begler. Unfortunately, I can't see the top of that one right now. But there's hundreds of these recordings available for free. All you do, all you do is click on it. That's all you have to do is click on it. Um, Oh, these are some uh, uh, documents um, that are uh, available uh, in the military history. Here is the Illinois Veterans History Project. Um, has anyone else heard of that? Okay. These are documents that the veterans will complete. And it says the Illinois Patriot Information Forum. It has their name. And of course, uh, this is my maiden name. So I thought, oh, let me look and see if one of my relatives is in here. Of course, no. 
because James is not my relative. Well, not that I know of this. His birthplace, his birth date, length of time, Patriot resided in Illinois, 64 years, male, branch, he was in the Navy, um, he, battalion, regiment, division, unit, ship, etc. I can't really read whatever, oh, it might be BET 28, highest rank, he enlisted, he wasn't drafted, service dates, 11, 1961, and he didn't finish, I mean, he didn't say when he concluded. Wars in which individuals served none. Location, he served in Turkey. Was the veteran a prisoner of war? No. Did the veteran sustain combat or service-related injuries? No. Uh, medal or service, medal or special service awards, national defense. They have, look at this, almost 7,000 images. 7,000 um, Illinois veterans that have completed this this document and posted it online. It's phenomenal. Uh, oh, this is Mount Prospect, Mount Prospect history. Uh, there's look, 266 pages, a ton of this family, with a very prominent family in Mount Prospect. Do, do it, does anyone here have a family picture like this? I mean, we just took a, a picture at a family reunion two years ago, and I think I had like maybe 50 people in it, but nothing like this. The only thing that's missing, who are they? <laughs> I mean, hopefully it's on the back of the photo or it's somewhere that people have identified each one of these precious family members, each one. Not sure. And this, these are the sons of Louis C. Bussey. Um, <laughs> pardon me. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see, it's Fred. This is Fred, Arthur, and Alfred. They were very prominent, but look, they have a car. So obviously they have some money. Actually, they have two cars, you're right. Two cars. Mount Prospect's oldest business building, circa 1910. Pardon me. Power space, a 10 cent cigar. This, I thought this was really a cool picture of uh, pictures that I found. This is uh, Sophie Seggers and William Press. Uh, November 10th, 1892. This is the photo on the left is when they got married at Emanuel Lutheran Church in Des Plaines. And he was the owner of the tavern, one of the earliest businesses in uh, Mount Prospect. The picture on the right, <coughs> Pardon me. The picture on the right is their 50th wedding anniversary. <coughs> Pardon me. In 1942. And if I didn't have this banner across here, <coughs> pardon me, you could see each of their children. And the best part of this is that, yes, it tells you Sophie and William. And then it says where they're seated, the children standing left, right, Lydia, but it also gave her married name. So you knew that she was married and now you knew her husband's name, Robert Hartman. Rudolph apparently wasn't married. Agnes, Mrs. Albert Winkleman, Conrad, Esther, Mrs. William Hansey, Henry, Sophie, and William. Obviously you can see William really cool because this nonsense isn't in the way. But again, that in itself is such valuable information. This is a great picture. Who wouldn't want to have a picture from 1892 of their ancestors' wedding photo? And here it is, three. Um, this is, I love city directories. And here's one from 1919 from Arlington Heights, Barrington, Lake Zurich, Mount Prospect, Palatine, Wakanda, and Wheeling. Again, when you're looking at a city directory, when you're looking at a city directory, always look at the beginning because you might just think that this was a Chicago telephone company. You might just think it's for one community, but look at all the communities that it includes. Includes. And there, look at all these bussy people. <laughs> They're quite, quite prominent. Uh, oral histories, again. 
This is an audio interview of John Beatty as he describes river life growing up on the Ohio River. Uh, even though he was uh, an Illinois resident, he was talking about how he was growing up in Ohio, um, or by the Ohio River in Kentucky. He was running whiskey during prohibition. He recalls riverboat collisions, wrecks, and salvaging operations as well. Also discusses, discusses diving to salvage scrap iron, operating a crane, running a towboat, and scrap derrick, and working for the marine underwriters uh, as a marine surveyor. 1957. And that was the interview. Uh, this is an audio bit interview of Mary Bell, who discusses her early um, uh, her, her early experiences as a, as Japanese immigrants in Seattle, Washington. Uh, she was growing up, she had a Japanese parent and an American parent, and how uh, the struggles that they had um, from the two different cultures. Uh, educate, uh, she's growing up in an international community, education at both American and Japanese schools, Japanese customs, her family visit to Japan in the mid-30s, and her father's illness, which required them to stay in Japan during World War II. And it's 360 minutes long, this tape. There's four tapes. And who interviewed her? Here's another one by Abby Parnell, wife of Leslie Parnell, an organ grinder. An organ grinder. That's kind of cool. Abby recalls her husband's occupation selling fruit, raising monkeys, and traveling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, one, it's 30 minutes, one tape. Uh, Cleo May Garrison, memoir, lifelong residence, uh, resident of Elmore, Illinois. She discusses her life as a woman in the 20th century, childhood chores, games, father and brother, home life, entertainment, and more. And that's five tapes at six hours long. Social movements, lots and lots of social movements. But I focused on the Illinois prisons. Um, I don't know if any of you have little black sheep in your family. I do. And I'm always looking to find out if I can find any incarceration records without having to re request them. And here, there's some old ones in here. Um, this is William Taylor, December 4th, 1833. He was um, incarcerated. He was sentenced to prison for counterfeiting. And here it says, uh, received the body of William Taylor in the penitentiary of Alton. Said Taylor, here it gives a description. He's five feet, nine inches high, slender, made, very ball headed, and about 77 years old. Says he has been a soldier in the revolution, sentenced for one year from the 12th day of November, 1833, for counterfeiting, 10 days of which he is to be put in solitary confinement. He was discharged November 12th, 1834. So he served. 11 months, a little bit about 11 months for counterfeit. counterfeit. Again, there's lots and lots of these documents. Some of them can be kind of difficult to read. This is the registry of prison, a prisoner incarcerated at the Joliet uh, Correctional Center um, from uh, dates 18, this is the record, 1847 through June 1975. Okay, that's just one of the little index cards you'll get. This was very difficult to read. I had to keep enlarging it and then going in and zooming in. Um, when a prisoner was uh, incarcerated, this was some of the information that they listed. Then they were given a number. We all know they're given numbers. Uh, then they indicated their name, the county that they were from, the crime, the sentence, uh, good time granted, good time lost, good time made, when they were discharged, their age, nativity, occupation, height, complexion, color of hair, color of eyes, relations, women, like wife, children, parents, religion, habits of life, education, term of court, and remarks. Habits of life. Like, what does that mean? Okay. Were they alcoholics? Were they criminals? That's what they meant by habits of life. Okay, 
uh, this person, convict registered, uh, John Ross, original sentence, life commuted sentence, 18 years. By whom? The governor, right there, commuted his sentence. So again, it does say the convict register, um, and this can be very difficult to read, but again, if it was one of your relatives that you suspected might have been incarcerated and then released for whatever reason, you know, I mean, look at how many governors and um, are released from prison. Mm -hmm. Look at how many presidents um, uh, allow certain people to be released or commute their sentences. It's pretty interesting information. Register of prison incarcerated Southern Illinois country. Penitentiary, also known as Menard Correctional Facility. This one was a little bit easier to read. Um, so you could see their numbers, their names, where they're from, um, murder, murder. Thank you. So those are just some of the records that you can find the prison. And again, here, this is when I was I was telling you this. This is a, one of the photographs which you can see now um, uh, that was duplicated. Rockford College collection. And this is a photograph of Anna Peck. So she was the first principal of the Rockford Female Seminary from 1854 to 1884. Um, and then she was the president of the, uh, well, she was president of the college as well. Pretty nice photograph. And then it talks about her obituary, how she was very instrumental in the school. Um, uh, and uh, what she meant, uh, some of her, uh, 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 the, the things that she had done during her time at the school. And then of course, uh, that she died at half past six o'clock Tuesday morning, and she'll be buried from the cemetery chapel on June, on uh, Thursday morning, June 20th at half past 10 o'clock. And that she was retired for five years. Well, she laid down her duties for five years. This was a college dorm at Rockford Female Seminary. I'm thinking, well, the size is probably pretty much like a college dorm today, but boy, they sure had a lot of nice things in there compared to when my kids went to college. They didn't have all those nice things. They had microwaves and refrigerators and TVs and computers. <laughs> this is a female uh, uh, student at the seminary uh, doing weight training in the gymnasium in 1882. Look at the weights, but look at what she's doing, all the little pulleys and the weights on the, on the photograph. This is an invitation from the senior class Rockford College to attend the commencement uh, exercises in 1895. And what I especially liked was Miss Jane Adams was going to be the commence, was going to present the commencement address. Oh, Jane Adams from Hull House. Here's some photographs of Abraham Lincoln from his collection, which is, um, I want to say there's at least 30 different uh, documents in uh, 30 different collections in this collection. Um, yeah, thank you. The, um, I'm going to go over a couple of them. Again, here's Oak Ridge Cemetery interment records, which I'd already discussed. Here, this is like the earth, well, this is the earliest known photograph of uh, Abraham Lincoln. I think, yeah, 1846. It would be nice if we could have seen the whole thing. And here's one. Uh, I, oh, 1864. The, actually, this picture, I had to really make it much bigger, but I wanted to get the bulk of them on this uh, slide. He actually has glasses on in this picture. Uh, and I believe that's his son, Todd. I believe that it's time in there. And this is uh, in 1862, probably in 1862. Uh, presidents usually look a little weathered after they've served a little while. This is from, uh, this is a, a, a story from President Lincoln's friend and self-appointed bodyguard. And he's talking about how uh, President Lincoln had really had, had time to prepare the Gettysburg Address. He was working on other things. 
And he said, you know, he always put, um, well, he didn't always, but he put uh, notes and things in his top hats. And he said when he gave the speech, um, he didn't feel that it was successful at all, that nobody liked it, the crowd was really quiet, nobody understood what he was trying to convey. But what actually happened is that when the press and Europe read the Gettysburg Address, they embraced it and thought, what a remarkable man this was to have the insights into what these, the military was doing and how important it was to the American history. And he, this, he was going on for four or five pages about how he, Lincoln was actually wiser than he knew. It was, it was really a, a fascinating little blurb from this um, a self-appointed bodyguard. Again, I was, uh, I could have put the Gettysburg Address in there, but I figured we all memorized it when we were in grammar school. Oh, not sure what happened there. So that's it. That's the Illinois State Archives. And again, I want, I just want to remind you that I, um, I only went over 10 of the collections. There's 20 collections in this, in the digital archives. And I can't tell you how many hours I have spent going through those collections and picking out. So, I mean, I, I picked out so many other ones that I took out or I added and got back and forth because um, I just wanted to give you a highlight of the information that is available for free in this collection. And all you have to do is just keep exploring. Sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes when uh, we're genealogists, we're in such a big hurry, uh, we want to find it. We know what we're looking for. We, we're going to a website. We want to put in the information that we know. We want to get the information that we want. And that's it. We don't really sometimes take the time to explore a collection and find out what else might be available. So, okay. Does anyone here have a question inside at all? No? No? Okay. Let me get to the chat and see because I have some people here that may have some questions. Well, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, here we, this person, please ask Cindy to check. Okay, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Um, does the website have any reports from the school for delinquents and asylums? I guess you would have to go to the um, community, the community where it was from and do a search and see if, if it was in there or send me an email and I'd be happy to do, um, do a search. Let's see. Is Illinois Digital Archives still just for libraries to put their information on? I believe a similar site in Florida called Florida Memories. Anyone can submit info. For example, info on Dixie Highway on the south side of Chicago. Can we as individuals, can we as, in, sorry, 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 sorry. Because we as in, individuals submit info, info to this website. Well, I'm very glad that this person asked this question because here at the New Lenox Library, um, when I was creating this PowerPoint, um, we have a collection here at the New Lenox Library that uh, is not really available very easily to our patrons. Uh, it has been, and then as the website has changed, sometimes the uh, information gets put on there and sometimes it gets put on a thumb drive. Um, I have it on a thumb drive. And these are in, this information that we have concerns the Civil War uh, soldiers from the New Lenox area, uh, the businesses from the Civil War time period, the schools, the churches, uh, Route 30. Um, it's just, I think there's, I think I figured there's 261 files. And right now we're working with the New Lenox Historical Society who originally gave us these articles of uh, these documents to see if we can have them added to the archives because we would like everyone to have access to it, just like we have access to all of these documents. So I don't know if individuals can submit the inf in information to the website or if you have to go to uh, the digital archives themselves, the uh, library, the Illinois State Library. 
that's what we're going. I'm going to be working with the Illinois State Archive of the Illinois State Library to see if we can get them up. What category were the prisoner records under? Um, institutional records. Let's see. Institutional records. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why? Okay. Let's just see. Well, I think it's institutional records, social movement um, records. Or collections, pardon me, collections. Let's see if there's any other questions. That's it. So if no one else has any questions, uh, feel free to, um, uh, this is a free website, Illinois Digital Archives. Uh, they are part of CyberDrive. You can get on CyberDrive, which is free also. I did give a handout to everyone here. It's also available. It was available on the Zoom link that I sent as well. Um, and again, these are, let me talk about the, the handout that I passed out. I went through every state and the only state that I couldn't find digital archives was New Hampshire. Not sure why, I couldn't find anything on digital, uh, free digital on the state of New Hampshire. That's not to say that maybe it's there hiding someplace. Uh, some, uh, digital collections are included in the historical societies from the state. Uh, some are from universities. Uh, uh, some public, New, New uh, York Public Library put a digital collection online that is uh, excellent. But almost everything that I uh, listed, you did not need a login. Even though it might say you need a login, I was able to search anything because I tried almost every one just to see if I could get access to their collections. And I was able to get every, every one I tried, I was able to get into their collections. And I, I use different search terms. Sometimes I use women's suffrage, some I use civil war, some I use the revolutionary war, Vietnam war, you know, just depend. Uh, when I went to look in like Wyoming, Montana, I put in wagon trains, um, uh, trails, all kinds of information. I was just using any kind of search term to see if I could find information. So uh, I think, I hope that that's um, uh, a resource that they'll use for sure. Uh, any any questions from people? No? Any information on November, December? I'm, I'm happy, Jerry, that you asked me that question. Uh, October, uh, we're going to have Tina. Tina come here and she's going to talk about uh, repositories here in Illinois uh, that uh, people can use and what uh, resources are available at those repositories. Uh, in October, I mean, par pardon me. No, that's October. Thank you. I have to remember this is September. In November, uh, Smokey the War Dog, we're going to have, it's a Zoom program, um, Smokey the War Dog. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but it's a wonderful uh, program, Smokey the War Dog, to celebrate Veterans Day. And then in December, once again, we're going to do a wrap up for people who want to share their success stories, uh, that they things that they have found in 2021 that were great, maybe the resources, how they found those uh, breakthroughs through their genealogy brick walls. Um, and then I have like the first five or six months of 2022 pretty much set up as well. Still working on that. But again, if you have um, any questions, you can always email me, ptaylor at nanomicslibrary.org. Um, or uh, if you want to set up a one-on-one, -on -one, we can do that uh, when I'm here. Um, I usually have to have like a 10-day notice so that I can put it on the schedule so my department head can clear time so I'm not on the desk. Um, and then I can also do them on Saturdays as well. Um, so if uh, no one has any questions, I want to thank everyone for coming. I do apologize for the screen not being the way the PowerPoint. Um, if, if anyone wants a copy of the PowerPoint, email me and I would be happy to send it to you. Okay, because these are all, this is all, and you won't get that, you won't get that uh, top banner in there when I send you a copy, but you have to have, it is, a, it is a large, large PowerPoint because of all the photographs. So I'd have to probably send it uh, some type of Google Doc 
to so that you can have it because it won't just go through uh, like AOL or Yahoo, Gmail. It has to go through like a Google Doc kind of thing. So, no questions? I think I'll turn on the lights and uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, oh, Marisa, thank you for another great program. Hope it was nice. Send it. Thank you.